Welcome to the Louisville Lectures Procedure Project. My name is Michael Burke. I'm the creator of Louisville Lectures, and I'm excited to share this series with you. As an introduction to why we created this series, we found that there was a need for high-fidelity, immersive, first-person procedure training material. Leaning on our experience in the medical education field, we decided to create this series, and I've been working with our colleagues to create a state-of-the-art resource viewable in high definition and in 3D. Whether you want to put on a VR headset or 3D glasses in a sim lab, or just need to refresh your memory at 2 a.m. in the ICU, we want to be there to help with your training. In this video, we will walk you through placing a central venous catheter in the IJ vein, the indications, contraindications, complications, informed consent, kit and equipment, ultrasound evaluation, and of course the procedure itself. There are several indications for placing a central venous catheter some of which require a specialized type of catheter or kit to place. For a basic triple lumen central venous catheter, indications include high volume fluid resuscitation, emergency venous access if no intraosseous kit is available, repetitive blood sampling, administering total parental nutrition, highly vasoactive agents, caustic agents, or other concentrated fluids. Specific indications requiring a specialized catheter or kit include hemodialysis and plasmapheresis, which would require a dialysis catheter, uh, insertion of a transvenous cardiac pacemaker, insertion of a pulmonary artery catheter, heart catheterization, pulmonary angiography, and ECMO, each requiring specific types of introducer catheter. As with any procedure, there are certain patient conditions that would make placing a central line contraindicated. Absolute contraindications include infection over the placement site, pathologic conditions such as superior vena cava syndrome, current venous thrombosis in the target vessel, and the insertion of catheters impregnated with antibiotics that the patient has a serious drug allergy to. Contraindications that would require extreme caution and a careful consideration for the balance of risks and benefits to that patient include a distortion of landmarks by trauma or other congenital abnormalities, Severe coagulopathies, including a patient being on anticoagulation and or thrombolytic therapy. Prior vessel injury or procedures to the target vessel. Patients who are uncooperative and conditions predisposing to venous sclerosis or thrombosis. As with any procedure, there are certain potential complications from placing a central venous catheter. Some complications can occur at any site, and some are site-dependent. Similarly, some complications are far more likely to occur during the placing of a central line, and some increase in probability the longer the line stays in place. For example, guide wire embolism can essentially only happen during the placement of a central line, while complications such as infection or thrombosis of the vein are far more likely to occur the longer a line is left in place. Complications that can occur at any site include arterial puncture and hematoma, vessel injury, air embolism, cardiac dysrhythmia, nerve injury, infection, thrombosis, catheter misplacement, and guide wire embolism. While all of these are possible during placement of the central venous catheter, infection and thrombosis are significantly less likely to occur at the time of placement and do increase in risk every day the central venous catheter is left in place, even with optimal care. Complications that are more site-dependent include pneumothorax, especially with the subclavian internal jugular approach, and hemothorax with the subclavian or internal jugular approach. Informed consent. To obtain informed consent from a patient, they must be legally competent to make the decision and must have capacity to make that decision as judged by a physician or other practitioner. To be able to consent the patient, you must explain the specific procedure that's about to be performed in patient-friendly language the indications for the procedure, the risks and benefits of the procedure, as well as the likelihood of each of these risks or benefits based on the clinical evidence that is available. We can also balance that clinical evidence with clinical judgment based on the patient's specific situation. We should discuss alternatives to this treatment or to this procedure, including the risks and consequences of declining the intervention or of using an alternative to the proposed procedure. Ideally, this consent would occur with a patient's family member in the room to help them with their decision. 
while more time consuming using a teach back method and having the patient repeat back the information as they understand it to the person completing the consent is a helpful way of ensuring that they understand the risks and benefits of the procedure that is about to be performed. Depending on state, regional, and other regulations, it may be required to have a witness sign the consent form to ensure that a valid consent was completed. Pre-procedure timeouts. Prior to every procedure, a timeout should be completed by the person who will be performing the procedure. Timeouts are a requirement of the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations in the United States as a quality and patient safety measure. A proper timeout will include having all team members in the room stop for the timeout. If possible, having the patient confirm the information. If the patient is not awake or able to confirm the information, it must be confirmed and read aloud by another team member in the room. At a minimum, the following information should be confirmed with the signed consent and patient chart. The name of the patient, the procedure to be performed, and which side and site the procedure is to be performed upon. Additional items that are helpful to include during a timeout include the presence of necessary equipment, patient allergies, and physically marking the procedure site as necessary. If more than one procedure is happening at the same time or will be happening in series, separate timeouts should occur prior to each procedure. Certain hospitals may have additional items that may need to be addressed during a timeout. Any significant delay or distraction between a timeout and the beginning of a procedure should result in another timeout being performed. Having the right equipment and enough equipment at bedside is essential to your success in placing a central venous catheter. A list of equipment that will be required includes an ultrasound machine with a linear probe, chucks, or other absorbent, non-permeable pad to place under the patient, a pair of chlorhexidine scrubs, or other antibacterial pre-procedure washes, a sterile drape, a sterile probe cover with sterile ultrasound jelly, a sterile gown, hat, sterile gloves, a mask with face and eye shield, 1% lidocaine without epinephrine, 2-3 to three sterile saline flushes, a syringe for your anesthetic and a small gauge needle, an 18 gauge needle or angiocath to use for cannulation, a Rollerson syringe or regular syringe to use for cannulation, a guide wire, number 11 scalpel, a dilator, the catheter itself, a catheter clamp, suture, an antibiotic patch, sterile dressing, sterile gauze, and a sharp solder. Prior to placing a central line, we must perform an ultrasound assessment to identify an ideal site for access. We will show an abbreviated version of the Rapid Clinical Evaluation for Vascular Access, or RECIVA, survey. Ultrasound considerations include examining the vessel caliber, which should be selected so that the catheter being placed is no more than one-third the size of the selected vessel. An easy way to remember this is the catheter's French size should be the same or less than the vessel's diameter in millimeters. You should also consider the depth of the vessel at the point you're selecting, especially relative to other nearby structures. We want to assess for vessel compression and pulsatility, not only to help differentiate artery from vein, but also to exclude thrombus or other pathology. It is important to consider the respiratory variation in the target vessel as well, as this could alter your site selection if it is significant. Exit site selection plays a role in preventing placement of a catheter unnecessarily high in the neck. Finally. A brief examination of the pleura is important to evaluate for any pre-existing pathology. Here we will look at four sites to assess the IJ vein anatomy. We will begin at the mid-neck, look at the IJ vein and carotid artery. Move to the base of the neck to look at the IJ vein, carotid artery, and subclavian artery. And tilt to get a sternoclavicular view, looking at the IJ vein, brachycephalic vein, subclavian vein. Finally, we will move down and evaluate for a sliding lung sign, as well as a sandy beach sign, to show that the pleura are presently intact and that there is no pneumothorax at the time prior to insertion. Here we have a graphic showing from a first-person perspective what the underlying anatomy looks like. Historically, central lines have been placed by anatomy alone, and for subclavians, this is still possible. For internal jugular, however, standard of care essentially requires the use of ultrasound to ensure cannulating the correct vessel and significantly speeds the procedure. Considering the prior discussion on the ultrasound evaluation, you could see by looking at this image that certain areas along the neck would have a favorable approach compared to others. The further you take the transducer towards the clavicle, the more lateral in this patient you see the internal jugular rotate compared to the carotid. 
being able to take the transducer all the way down to the clavicle and then rocking the transducer back towards the operator, you will be able to see the guide wire disappearing down towards the IVC to confirm that your line would be in the correct place. We're going to start our first person view of the procedure here by showing our setup on the right with a Mayo stand with everything prepped and ready to go. We've got an ultrasound front and center here with sterile jelly going onto it. Here we have our lidocaine making a skin wheel. And we do that having already identified by ultrasound where we want to go beforehand. Before I actually place the needle into the skin, I make sure on ultrasound that I am completely lined up with the vessel using the black arrow in the middle of the ultrasound probe to lie directly over the top of the IJ vein. After this, I can place the needle into the skin at that point, and from there, I'll essentially be looking up at the monitor and advancing under direct ultrasound guidance. Here, before I take the needle to cannulate the IJ, I confirm with ultrasound that we're in the precise place that we want to be for an insertion site compared to where the anatomy lines up in the optimal position. Once it appears that I'm in the vessel on ultrasound, I'm able to look down and note that I am in. When you're advancing your needle, you should always have back pressure on the plunger and often before you even see on the screen that your needle is in the vessel, you'll actually feel yourself go through the wall of the vessel itself and you'll feel the blood return come into the syringe. Once I've confirmed blood return into the syringe, I immediately put down the ultrasound probe and take my left hand and plant it on the patient's chest, really resting my hand on their sternum and using my fingers to secure the needle itself so that it doesn't move into or out of the vessel. From this point, I try to make my left hand completely still and use my right hand to gently disconnect the syringe from the needle. We then take the guide wire and advance carefully, making sure to never ever let go of the guide wire to prevent a guide wire embolus. Once the guide wire is advanced most of the way in, leaving quite a few centimeters, at least 10 to 12, outside of the needle, we're able to pull the needle out of the skin along with the guide wire and then slide the needle off over the guide wire. At this point, we can put down some gauze and take the ultrasound to confirm placement in the IJ. We then take our scalpel and with the cutting edge up, out, and away from the patient's body, make a small skin nick as possible to allow the dilator to pass over the wire. I try to make as small of a skin nick as possible that I think will allow the dilator to pass through the soft tissue into the vessel. Another way to help prevent kinking in the guide wire is to respect the angle of the wire entering the vessel when using the dilator. While advancing the dilator, you want to grip it fairly close to the patient's skin. You'll want to use a twisting motion as you advance the dilator. This will help you from being caught on the soft tissue and preventing it from bunching up. If you'll notice, when I'm advancing the dilator, I take a very shallow angle to the skin. Because the wire comes out of the skin at a fairly flat angle to the neck, using a more acute angle, which would mean having the dilator more vertical, would make it more likely to kink the wire just because the angle of passage through the soft tissue into the vessel would not follow the path we previously used with the needle. In this case, because the patient was on blood thinning medication, I opted to make the smallest nick possible with my first pass. As you can see, the dilator would not pass over the tapered end, and so we make a slightly larger incision with our scalpel to allow the dilator to pass more easily. Notice on the second attempt how much easier the dilator passes. It's still a relatively small skin nick, and when pulling out the dilator, it's easy to tell that the dilator is snug to the skin and soft tissue. However, approximately half of the dilator passes in the vessel with minimal effort. If too small a nick is made, the skin and soft tissue will bunch around the dilator, which can cause the wire itself to bend. Once the guide wire is kinked, the guide wire and dilator must be pulled out of the body. Because the kink in the guide wire can significantly compromise its structural integrity, it is important if the guide wire does become kinked to pull the guide wire and dilator out. If you're able to see the kink and then pass the dilator safely 
over that point and make contact with the skin, you can then make a slightly larger skin knit and see if the dilator will pass. Containing the kinked portion of the guide wire out of the back end of the dilator prevents the possibility of shearing off that weak point into the patient. I then ensure that my brown port is unclamped on the central catheter and advance the guide wire into it until I see it exit the brown port. Once I can see a few centimeters come out of the end of the port, I grab the wire there and then slowly, steadily using a gentle twisting motion, advance the catheter into the vessel. I then remove the guide wire and I make sure with my left hand to hold the catheter vertical to allow any air that has gotten into the brown port from having it uncapped and unclamped rise and won't go into the patient. Allowing blood to sit in that portion of the line will cause it to clot and will not allow you to use that portion of the catheter. Once I see it flush clear, I clamp and move on to flush the other ports. Again here with the white port, I draw all the air up until I see blood just barely come into the syringe and then flush all the way back down until the entire line on that portion of the port is clear. Then clamp that port and move on to the third. It's important to note that during the setup for this line, not included with this recording, all of three of these lines were primed with saline to flush any air out of them before the procedure began. It's also important to do to ensure that all three ports are patent before the line is placed. At this point, the line is in, all three ports draw and flush and have been clamped, and it's time to suture. Here we have a catheter clamp, this piece of blue and white rubber and plastic. This is a fairly valuable piece of equipment to know how to use correctly. Because these center lines are placed in the neck, the top of the line often flops downward and any sterile dressing that's placed with adhesives will slowly be peeled away which allows infection to occur. This particular piece of the kit can be used to secure the line at a separate point, allowing you two specific points of attachment that will allow you to take the three ports in somewhat of a U-shape to be pointed down. This allows the three ports to finally be facing downward towards the patient's body, and having this orientation along with the two points of support allows a sterile dressing to be placed without the pull of gravity to open it up to infection. Here you can see that I begin using this catheter clamp to sew the line in at about a 45 degree angle. This combined with the space between the catheter clamp and the actual catheter's suture attachment points will allow me to suture this line in with a final orientation pointing the ports down somewhere between the shoulder and the second third of the clavicle. This will allow us to place a sterile dressing that won't be pulled down significantly by three ports that are vertical and dangling outward over the patient's chest, constantly pulling that adhesive away from the skin, allowing infection potentially to get into the site. We hope you've enjoyed learning a bit more about this procedure. If you're new to Louisville Lectures, please check us out at louisvillelectures.org or subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for watching.